With the authority of the Council, I shall now confer the degree of Doctor of the University. I call upon the Vice-Chancellor to make this presentation. Chancellor, the Council of the University has resolved to award the degree of Doctor of the University to Neville Thomas Bonner, AO. Neville Thomas Bonner was born on Eucariba Island in the Tweed Heads district in 1922. He spent his early years in difficult circumstances, living in a number of camps where hunger, discrimination and lack of schooling were commonplace. Having received only one year of formal schooling at the age of 13, Neville Bonner is of necessity self-taught. He speaks regularly and persuasively of the school of life and the education which humans receive simply by living. Nonetheless, Neville Bonner recognises the importance of formal education as a major instrument in improving the lot of his community and is a strong advocate for education of all young Aborigines. From his mid-teens, Neville Bonner worked on banana plantations, at ring barking and scrub felling, as a dairy hand and later as a stockman. In 1945, Neville Bonner and his family moved to the Palm Island Aboriginal community in Queensland, where he became actively involved in community affairs, rising to the position of assistant settlement overseer responsible for the administration of works. It was during these years that he learned the powerful principle of racial togetherness, a principle he has advocated since. During the 1960s, he became involved with the Coloured Welfare Council, which later became the One People of Australia League, OPAL. He was elected to the Board of Directors of OPAL in 1965. During his years as Senator, Neville Bonner continued his involvement with OPAL, serving as State President from 1970 to 1976. In 1979, he was honoured with life membership of OPAL and he is now president of the League. With the encouragement of his family, Neville Bonner became seriously interested in politics. He joined the Liberal Party in 1967 and became the first Australian Aborigine in federal parliament when he was elected to the Senate in 1971. There, he was able to give effect to his strong commitment to helping the underprivileged particularly in the areas of education and local government. He was elected Senate Deputy Chairman of Committees in July 1974 and served on the Joint Parliamentary Publications Committee, Senate Standing Committee on Social Welfare, Regulations and Ordinances Committee and the Joint House Committee. He was also a member of the Senate's Aboriginal Affairs, Federal Affairs and Health and Welfare Committees. In August 1976, Neville Bonner, as chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, presented to Parliament the committee's final report on the environmental conditions of Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, the culmination of five years' work by the Senate Committee. 82 of the 86 recommendations to the government were accepted. One of the most momentous occasions of his career was on 15 September 1976, when he introduced his own private members bill entitled Aborigines and Islanders Admissibility of Confessions Bill. In doing so, Neville Bonner became the first Aborigine to introduce legislation into the Australian Parliament. He was also the first backbencher to introduce a government bill, the Aboriginal Development Commission Bill, and carry it through all stages. A year later, as chairman of the Joint Committee on Aboriginal Land Rights in the Northern Territory, he tabled that committee's final report in Parliament. During his long and fruitful years as Senator, Neville Bonner's greatest joy was being out amongst the real people. He visited many parts of the state and always found talking to the people he represented a revitalising experience. His personal aim in life, to serve all people irrespective of colour and class, continues to be manifest in his involvement as patron or member of numerous organisations including World Vision Australia, Ipswich Women's Shelter, the Coloured Youth Soul Centre and Amnesty International. After the conclusion of his term as Senator in 1983, he became a director of the board of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation 
and remained in that role until 1992. He has also been the senior official visitor at all state prisons in Queensland since 1990 and is a member of the Queensland Aboriginal Lands Tribunal. He has been involved with a number of educational institutions nationwide, lecturing in an honorary capacity. In 1992, the Griffith University Council decided that a person of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent should occupy one of the two positions on the council for co-opted for co-opted members. Neville Bonner was approached and the university was honoured by his acceptance of the position. Subsequently and in the same year, the council appointed him as chairperson of its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Committee. Under his guidance, the committee has raised the profile of university-wide activities designed to represent the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff and students and to raise general university and community awareness of the needs of this group. Among Neville Bonner's many enduring contributions are his publications, such as Black Power in Australia, as well as Equal World, Equal Share, and For the Love of Children, the last two written for World Vision. Neville Bonner's outstanding achievements have been acknowledged by being chosen as Australian of the Year in 1979 and the award of Officer of the Order of Australia in 1984. The Aboriginal community paid him a particular tribute by naming a $4 million building in Canberra, Neville Bonner House. This is currently used by the Aboriginal Development Commission, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and Aboriginal Hostels. It is especially fitting that the Council of Griffith University should honour Neville Bonner in recognition of his distinguished contributions to the community over a very long period of time. Mr Chancellor, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Neville Thomas Bonner, Officer of the Order of Australia, for admission to the degree of Doctor of the University. Chancellor, I now call upon Mr Neville Thomas Bonner, AO, Doctor of the University, to deliver the occasional address. <laughs> Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, academic staff, members of council, all you wonderful, lovely students down in front of me, ladies and gentlemen, first let me say, from a very humble heart, thank you, Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, and the council, for the honour that you have bestowed on me this evening. I pray God will give me the courage and the strength to live up to the honour that you have paid me. This evening, I will be speaking from a paper that I've called My Advice. At the outset, I shall address myself to Aboriginal youth. But being a firm believer in the, to, in the togetherness of all Australians, my attention will turn and be directed to non-Aboriginal youth. My maternal Aboriginal grandfather was Junju, anglicised name Roger Bell, the last initiated member of the Jagra tribe in whose country I now reside. He, my Aboriginal grandmother, my mother, and my Aboriginal father became fringe dwellers. They were dispossessed of their heritage and land and consequently became members of what I term the Legion of the Lost. 
I was born in a blacks camp in New South Wales. That I survived is a minor miracle for hunger, cold, deprivation, ill health, drunkenness was the norm in those surroundings. My mother Julie decided my brother and sister and I needed schooling, so off we went, ever so proudly dressed in hand-me-down, cut-down trousers, shirts skillfully made from flower bags turned inside out. The event was calamitous. Since the parents of the white kids were warned of our presence, and hey presto, after much surreptitious scurrying, the school was left with only little black bonners in attendance. I tried again years later at Bow Desert State School, and I successfully completed one year of formal education, rising to grade four. The years before and after my formal education attempt were filled with income earning activities. I included gathering grass seed for sale, making, my, uh, working as a banana plantation laborer, dairy hand, scrub fella, stick picker, ring barker, fence builder, stockman, rodeo rider, head stockman, grover, cane cutter. These work experiences were punctuated punctuated by times of jumping the rattler, illegally jumping on and traveling on railroad, on, on the rail trains. Dossing down for the night in all tops, types of comfortable and not so comfortable places, intermittent sojourns into Aboriginal communities for a big feed and loving care from relations, relations to you. At last I married and moved with my family, my Aboriginal wife, to her birthplace, Palm Island, 75 kilometres off the coast of Townsville, Queensland. I became works overseer of 250 men, remaining there for 15 years, so I, and I subsequently took my wife, five sons and two foster daughters, to live in Jagara country, Ipswich, Queensland, where I managed, ma managed a dairy farm and tried my hand at boomerang manufacturing, followed by bridge carpentering and on into the Senate of our Commonwealth Parliament in 1971. I was then aged 49. I possessed no birth certificate. In fact, I didn't even know if my birth had been registered. And in my wallet, I had only five dollars. Most humbly, I say, the rest of my life is Australian history. So, what has all this got to do with you, my Aborigine sons and daughters? It has all got to do with you. Otherwise, the struggle of my life, the struggle of my count contemporary Aboriginal fellows, whose numbers are legion, would have been in vain. I charge you to be forever aware and proud, proud of your Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, whatever your chosen skill may be. Be it ringer, fitter, boiler maker, typist, chemist, mother, father, lawyer, driller, dressmaker, teacher, nurse, nursing aide, politician, sportsman or woman, cane cutter, engine driver, and so on. Into all facets of Australian community living, I expect you to direct yourselves, and at the same time, I expect you to become part of any decision-making instrumentalities, for far too long, far too long indeed, have we been decided for. Step into your chosen role with dignity and determination, for you represent the most unique culture on earth. Get off your bunties, backside, and get moving, and get moving now. Of course, my sons and daughters, no one knows more than I that it takes courage, coming as we do from a background of communal living, communal tri tribal living, that is, and more recently, a community of extended family living. It is apt to be lonely in certain roles, particularly for those up front. There will be no acclaim. 
Yet I promise, I promise that each brave step forward you take makes it much easier for the next Aborigine who, will, who comes along. And I pray you will hold on to that in your moments of despair. What do I impart on you, precious youth of our race, our golden future, concerning the psychological scars we all bear? We all bear these as a, as a result of our almost total dispossession of our home countries and the accompanying disruption of our 50,000 years of ordered living. Oh yes, we are all scarred. I acknowledge my scarring and came to terms with it as much as possible. It was not easy, but the alternative, the alternative is bitterness. Bitterness which ultimately destroys both body and soul. Secondly, I took a long, long, long look during my youth at the non-Aboriginal Australians and decided to accept many of their virtues and disclaim their vices, while at the same time claiming our Aboriginal virtues and disregarding our few vices. You note, I say our culture has only a few vices. True, however, no matter how you play it, I must warn against carrying a chip or block on the shoulder. I will never excuse a chip on the shoulder attitude in the young of my race. For in contrast to the inflicted misery and hardship on the Aboriginal generations since the advent of European settlement in this country, cannot, you cannot begin to know what hardship was. Let me turn to, se to our sensitivity. Be proud of this emotion, for I find sensitivity to lead to one of the most noble attributes of mankind, compassion. My advice to you, the young of my race, is to forever display compassion towards all fellow Australians, regardless of their ethnic background, age, and skills. Surely we who have been conquered are able to emerge from our dark, dismal depths with loving, caring, and compassionate hearts, giving to others the very qualities we expected from our conquerors. This is truly, I believe, the way we are, for we are descendant from a loving, sharing, caring, compassionate culture. I charge you here now to show compassion at all times, Aborigine to Aborigine, for, it is, for if there is one paramount obstacle to the onward march of today's Aborigines, it is the public or private knocking of one Aborigine by other Aborigines. Earlier I spoke of the courage it takes for the lone Aborigine to step out from the Murray Mob, the Murray Road. I feel so strongly about compassion, my young hopes for the future, that if any one of you lacks compassion, then I don't want to know you. The natural progression from sensitivity to compassion leads to loyalty, and I am forced to ask myself, what has happened to loyalty in this Australia of ours? Answer me if you are able. Here, where is the loyalty and mateship I knew in ring barking camps, cattle stations, and while droving? Why the demise of loyalty in partnership, woman or man, loyalty in family or kinship groups? I challenge you to go find it, this lost ingredient so vital for the cementing together of human beings into an indestructible unit. You may woo, weave through your tapestry of, the tapestry of your life strong cords of sincerity. I suppose what I'm saying is fair dinkum Aussie to fair dinkum Aussie. And believe me, there are no more fair dinkum Aussies than Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. I would have to advise 
at all times be genuine. From the story of my life, you would observe that I have been around. I've been almost drowned in insincerity, compelling me to rank good old time-tested sincerity very, very high on my advice. May, I say may, it rank high also on your list. Now you have heard other old Aborigines begin a tale, when I was a lad. Well, mine goes like this. Once when I was a youngster, a skinny, cold, black youngster, living in a humpy on the outskirts of Lismore, New South Wales, a shopkeeper gave my grandmother a packet of porridge, peppered with weevils. Wow, we thought. We are going to eat breakfast like the white fellow. As the adults set about soaking the porridge to enable the weevils to float and to be tipped away, I remembered white people had milk and sugar on their porridge every morning. Gee, every morning. Now, we'd, had, we'd got syrup or treacle. That did in place of sugar. And I thought I'd just nip up the road and ask the farmer living reasonably near for some milk. I greeted the stern-faced farmer with the astonishing announcement, we're having porridge. Could I have some separated milk? Oops, I literally hit the ground. As he screamed, he'd need his milk for his pigs and not for some little black me. I tell you this story, my sons and daughters, to illustrate not discrimination or cruelty, but how I came to my goals. For right there and then I determined someday I would have all the porridge, sugar and milk I could eat. And for as long as I wanted to eat it. Oh yes, I achieved this, this special goal and more. I firmly believe that that Northern Rivers farmer planted my little black feet steadfastly on the rocky road leading to Australia's Senate. I traveled on, ready to accept each and every discomfort, savagery, and racial hatred felt by refugee Aborigines in that era, and turn it into yet another determined goal. If I achieved goal after goal, so perhaps can you, in this easier and more enlightened era for Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. My ambition for my people and myself was planted by that farmer, watered by the one year of formal education, but nurtured by the skills I acquired along the hard road. You, my young Murrays, I re recommend that you take advantage of the various types of education being offered to Aborigines today. There is an old bush saying, it is an old dog with a hard road, leave the putts down on the flats. I have walked the flat where you are now, my black puppies, and I do not want it for you. You will gain your goals of the high road through education. Because the number of Aboriginal students undertaking secondary education has increased from 19,000 in 1981 throughout Australia to 35,000 in 1993. My advice is that you swell, you swell those numbers. The Aboriginal Study Grant Scheme, ABSTUDY, which began in 1968 as a scheme to assist those of us who wish to undertake courses of further education after secondary schooling and ABSEX, Aboriginal Secondary Education Grant, are designed for those Aborigines who are eligible for admission to colleges, universities, and other appropriate institutions. In the first year of, op op of operation, 115 ABSTUDY grants were made. But over 25 years later, the number of Aboriginals receiving these grants for tertiary and adult education has jumped dramatically to some 22,500. Of course, this has required a high level of government assistance 
but the rewards for, of, for, of such efforts can be measured by the greater participation of Aborigines in the workforce. This leads me to the broader aspect of education and how it affects us as Aborigines today. Education is of prime importance in making one's way as an Aborigine in Australia today. Young Aborigines are now moving into a broader spectrum of careers and professions. Educators should then no longer be constrained by narrow notions of fixed Aboriginal careers. There have been assumptions that areas suitable for Aboriginal careers include only teaching, nursing, social work, public Aboriginal administration, typist, and so on. Of worthy as these occupations continue to be, educators must now think in terms of Aboriginal doctors, lawyers, psychologists, professors and scientists, engineers and broadcasters. For increasing numbers of us are entering into these areas of professional training. So grab hold and like an, like an eagle, soar up and up, taking our Aboriginal race with you. I recommend that in whatever walk of life you select, act with great responsibility. Do not, I beg you, give credence to the monstrous belief of many non-Aboriginal Australians that we are an irresponsible people. We are the descendants of our once proud owners of this vast continent who for over 50,000 years lived a regimented lifestyle and who were masters of their own destinies. Immorality in the area of our tribal ancestors was punishable by death, spearing, or lonely banishment. So what has happened? No, I don't mean to the punishment. I mean to the morality of Aboriginal youth. I cannot believe that after the cruelties and disadvantages endured by temporary fellow Aborigines, endured in the main, to enable our Aboriginal race to survive, that you would be stupid enough to fall prey to modern day morality with its risks of AIDS and lesser scourges. I firmly believe we are members of the most accept adaptable race on earth. We comprise today almost 2% of Australia's population, having survived all the weaponry and so -called that so-called European civilization could aim at us. 45% of the Aboriginal race is integrated into the broader space age Australian community and retains its ethnic identity. That is ap adaptability. But do not da dare take to take up adaptation to the extreme. Remember what I said earlier, accept many of their virtues and disclaim their vices. My final bit of exclusive advice to you, my Aboriginal sons and daughters, is extremely difficult to follow. When situations of relations go awfully awry, do not cast around for someone to blame until you have taken a deep, honest look into yourself and your own actions. It is astounding how 96% of the time our biggest enemy is ourselves. And when you fully recognize this revelation, you are well on the road to maturity and off the flat, not the high ground. To non-Aboriginal young, I say, most of what I have said applies to you also, for pride, Dignity, courage, sensitivity, compassion, loyalty, mateship, partnership, sincerity, goals, education, responsibility, morality, and self-evaluation are the ingredients for total maturity, no matter what race, color, or creed. To me, of course, the major component is love of God. And unapologetically, I confirm I'm an old-time religion fellow myself. I would convey to white youth 
my deep appreciation for at no time since my birth in 1922, in that miserable blacks camp, have I found white Australia so ready and eager to attempt to understand the indigenous as your race, as your age group now. The young of my race must, I stress must, be allowed to step forward and they must be allowed a greater degree of self-determination. Many times, many times that intangible dream, that utopia has been talked about. The very edge of young black and white, and young white contact in this country is the area in which, which this ideal state will eventually develop. Unfortunately, learning and teaching alone will not get you across cultural barriers. These barriers can only be crossed one side to the other, black to white, white to black, by communicating while experiencing each other. My treasured sons and daughters of Australia, this beloved country of ours will flourish in harmony only when you view it through the knowledge that for an enthralling rhapsody to be played successfully on a piano, one has to play the white and black keys together. Finally, may I say, may God grant you the talents of communication and harmony for the benefit of this great nation of ours. Thank you.